This review is meant to help prepare for the biology keystone exam. At this point, we are on our last podcast with ecology, and you should be finishing up the remainder of questions in your keystone packet, which would be all of the questions shown here. To start off, it's really important to distinguish between ecology and environmental science. More often than not, people like to interchange the two, but ecology is really just about the actual organisms and the environment. How do they interact with other organisms? How do they act, interact with their food sources? Once we throw human beings like ourselves into the mix, then it's no longer ecology, then we're looking at environmental science. For the Keystone exam, we're not focusing on the human portion, we're really just focusing on the organisms and how they work with their environment, so we're focusing solely on ecology. With ecology, scientists like to break down ecosystems and areas from a very small perspective to a very large perspective. So you can see down here, we start very, very small, one individual organism, and we go all the way up to the biosphere. So what I'd like to do is just define these terms so that you have some understanding of what they mean. An individual and organism is literally one living thing. In the picture shown here, we are simply looking at just one ladybug. A species is the idea that you have organisms or individuals that can interbreed to produce offspring that are fertile. And that was something we talked about in the evolution podcast where once those species became different enough, they couldn't do this, so they were no longer species. But it's important to note that if I have a group of individuals that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring, that's my species. If we wanted to look at all the species in one defined area, that's our population. It could be how many of the same species of mite are eating and living in your eyebrow. It could be how many different insects can you find in all of Council Rock South or Council Rock North. It could be how many different fir trees are in Bucks County or wherever you're looking at. You define the area, but it's all of the same species. Once you decide to involve multiple species, which you can see here, it's not just ladybugs anymore, it's ladybugs and other plants, then we're looking at community. And again, it's in that same type of defined area. Go even bigger. Now we're not just looking at one species, we're not just looking at multiple species, we are also looking at the non-living factors in there. So what is the climate like? Is there water there? Are there rocks that are high in certain types of minerals? It's necessary for those organisms to survive going even bigger, regions that have the same kind of traits and characteristics where the animals are the same and the plants are the same and they have adapted for those type of requirements of the climate, then we call it a biome. And you guys have heard of biomes, tropical rainforest is a biome, the tundra is a biome, the taiga, um, deciduous forest, those are just large regions, same climate, same weather patterns, same temperature, all that, and the animals and plants adapt. And then lastly, we have this upper piece here, and this is the biosphere. And this is everywhere on the planet that there's life. And honestly, there are more places on the planet that do have life than those that don't. It may not be life that you and I think of as cute and cuddly mammals, but certainly bacteria are completely ubiquitous on this planet. So our biosphere is pretty much whole surface of the planet, and even up in altitude and below the sea where life exists. When we look at these different organisms and how they interact with each other, one thing we tend to focus on is the flow of energy and environment. So this morning when you got up for breakfast, if you had breakfast, you know, you consumed food. That's something that you do. By consuming food, you're a heterotroph. And by consuming food, you're a consumer, not a producer. So looking at this, you can see down here, producers are organisms that are going to make energy. The flow of energy in the ecosystem, producers make it. Typically, because they make their own food and they produce food for others, we can also call them autotrophs. A great example is plants, and decomposers really kind of go from here down to here, but they do recycle and provide nutrients. You're going up one higher step here. You have your primary consumers, so they're not producing food, they're consuming food. They're the first organisms to actually consume it, so we call them primary. These are typically your herbivores, because they are eating the plant matter of the producers. And we can also refer to them as heterotrophs, because again, they don't make their own food. They're not self-feeding. They have to eat food. Typically, animals fit into this category. Go up even one more. Secondary consumers. Well, if our primary consumers are the first to consume, our secondary consumers are going to be second to consume. They will consume the primary consumers. They are also going to be heterotrophs because they do not make their own food. And at this point, we're going to call them carnivores because they are eating other animals. 
and these are typically animals as well. And then finally you get to the top here and you could have a couple of steps between secondary, you could have tertiary, but typically you're looking at the top is this is the king of the pyramid or the king of the food chain. This is the one that typically they don't have many or any predators up at top. They're going to be carnivores because they're going to be eating other animals and they are going to be heterotrophs because they're going to be eating other organisms. So this idea of studying this flow is bioenergetics. Now here's just an example of that same kind of idea we saw before. Phytoplankton in this case, algae is my producer. Go up one, they're herbivores because they're eating that. The zooplankton eat the phytoplankton. And then you've got carnivorous zooplankton that are going to eat these uh, zooplankton. You get fish, and here tuna will be your top consumer. This can work for an aquatic ecosystem, like the one shown here, all living in water. Or it can work for a terrestrial ecosystem, shown here. These are the ones that are on land. One other thing to focus on is you can see on the right-hand side of this pyramid, it's saying available energy units. So 1,000 pieces of energy are available for the producers to use. And what you see is every single time you are dropping that factor down significantly. This is one-tenth of what it was. One-tenth of the previous level, one-tenth of the previous level, one-tenth of the previous level. The ma vast majority of that goes into losing energy as heat. 90% is lost as heat from a transfer from one energy level to another one. And you can see that here, not as well represented, but you can see each one of these levels is smaller and smaller because the energy available to the first order consumers, or the primary consumers, is one tenth of what was available to the green plants. The energy of the secondary consumers, or second order consumers is one tenth what was available to the insects and here your top consumer your snake has only one tenth of the energy so what we're looking at is vast amount of energy is lost in ecosystems as heat we can also look at just a very straightforward relationship and when we look at just one straightforward one we call it either an energy or a food chain chain because it's really saying from here to here to here to here so you can see they're showing you other nutrients going so the producers could make food, eaten by primary consumers, eaten by secondary consumers, and you have your top or tertiary consumer. And then when these organisms die, the nutrients go back here, a small percentage of them, by the way, of a decomposer. As nice as this system is, it's not 100% accurate because you're only looking at one teeny tiny piece of how the actual ecosystem works. So, in comparison, here's another food chain, very straightforward, very linear. Here is a food web that would come from that same ecosystem. You can see here that this is not the only primary consumer. Deer are a primary consumer. We can also see this rabbit is a primary consumer. You can also see there's not just one producer, as you see in this picture, but there's also this tree here. And then you can see that this owl is not the only primary, or the only top consumer. You also have a hawk here and then there are a bunch of intermediates that you don't see in this diagram. So a food web shows you far more interconnections and shows you just how fragile an ecosystem is because if this little chipmunk were lost to this ecosystem you could see how many other animals depend on it as a food source. So one thing that affects an ecosystem are these ideas of limiting factors. What it is, is it's chemical, so it could be a food source or something like that. It could be physical, like weather, that affects how these organisms will grow, affects how the population works. So obviously, if you are in an environment where there is no water, and there normally is plentiful amount of water, that's going to have a drastic effect on the ecosystem. If there's a place that's very, very low in nutrients, then that's going to prevent many types of organisms to grow unless they have the correct adaptations to survive there. So when we look at factors of an ecosystem, and these can be limiting factors, these are kind of what's happening in an ecosystem. What are the things that explain why certain animals can live there, why certain plants can live there? So we break them into two groups. We have biotic factors and we have abiotic factors. For biotic factors, you want to focus on the prefix bio, and we know bio means life. So these are things that are actually living that are going to influence an organism. It could be their food source that they eat. It could be the predators that eat them. Or it could be their homes. In the case of this little bunny, 
Not only is he probably eating some of this green stuff here, he may also live in one of these bushes. Your abiotic factors, a means not, so these are your non-living things. This could be more weather aspects. What's the wind like there? Is it so windy that smaller organisms can't stay there? Uh, is there no water? So these organisms can't survive unless they have adaptations to store water. Is the temperature too hot for them? Is the temperature too cold for them? So you can see here, in this case, my physical idea was there was some sort of either volcano or something that could have come here. That's abiotic, and it's changed their landscape. It's also probably changed the temperature, so that's going to affect these organisms. We also, we talked about many different elements way back in the first podcast. We had our chops in, carbon being an important element, hydrogen being an important element, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and nitrogen. These elements are important for all living things, and in an ecosystem, there are different cycles that show the different forms of carbon, how they're used by organisms, and how they're not used. There's different forms of nitrogen, how they're used by organisms, and how do they go from phase to phase. So we call them biogeochemical cycles, because bio is referring to living organisms have a factor in and geo. Some of these things get stored in the Earth's crust, they get stored in water, or a part of the geology allows them to go in here. So carbon by itself, nitrogen, those are abiotic factors. And we can also call them nutrient cycles because we need them. So water cycles, an example, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, there's a whole bunch of them. Here's just a sample one. This is looking at carbon cycle really and they're kind of showing you how carbon goes in. So we need sunlight for plants and what they do is they take CO2 in, we talked about that in a previous podcast, and what they're able to do is take in other nutrients if they need them to make glucose, which is our organic carbon molecule. Plants will use it, animals will eat it, and then if animals breathe out, like we do, every time we exhale, part of cellular respiration, we spit that CO2 back up. Plants also carry out respiration because plants need to break down sugars for energy too, so they'll put it in there. As human beings, we take some of the stuff that's in the ground, so there's the geo part of the biogeochemical cycle, and we use those fossil fuels, and as we burn them, what we're looking at here is they're spitting them back into the air. So the cycle is just showing you how is this nutrient or how is this abiotic factor in the case of carbon, how is it actually being cycled through the ecosystem. When we go back to the idea of ecology really focusing on how organisms interact with the environment and how organisms interact with the other organisms, we tend to see certain patterns that happen. And one of them is competition. And competition is you're the same species, in the case of these two bears, or you could be different species, but you want the same thing. And in this case, they might be fighting for a mate. That's a resource. They might be fighting for fish that's in there. That's a resource the same place at the same time. They are competing with each other so that they can survive, so that their genetic material gets passed on for that whole idea of Darwin's natural selection and evolution. We also have predation. One animal looks yummy, so another animal eats it. So I have here a fox eating some sort of mammal down here, and then I have a ladybug eating an aphid. So one of them just eats the other, predator-prey kind of relationship. And then we have symbiosis, and we can actually break down symbiosis into three separate groups. But symbiosis, I think of sim, which means together. So these are organisms that live closely together. It could be a relationship that benefits both of them. It could be a relationship where only one is benefited, or it could be a relationship where one is significantly harmed. And for each of these, we have different terms that go with them. So mutualism, happy, happy. In this case here, you can see this insect. It feeds off of the orange flowers, and as it feeds off of the orange flowers, it carries pollen from one plant to another plant. So the plant benefits by being able to reproduce and switch up its genetic makeup, and the insect benefits because it's able to eat. Commensalism is happy and neutral. So in this case, you can see here, those birds, they are eating insects and other things that are on the mammal's back. It doesn't really hurt the mammal to have them there. The mammal doesn't really benefit from it, so they would be the neutral and the bird would be the smiley face. And then you have parasitism, which is happy face, frowny face. One organism is greatly benefiting, one organism is not benefiting. So you can see here, 
This caterpillar is the frowny face one. A wasp or some other sort of insect has laid its eggs on top of the caterpillar. And what happens is as those eggs hatch, they will actually devour that insect for food. We can also talk about what happens when new species come to an area. And when we talk about species that are normally there, and sometimes you might hear these referred to as native species, they are called endemic. And these are things that are supposed to be there, they've kind of always been there, and they're restricted to that area. They wouldn't survive well outside of that area normally because they don't have the correct adaptations. And then we also have non-native species. And what happens is they are outside of their normal zone. And a lot of times we brought them here on purpose because we thought they were pretty. If we think about a lot of ornamental plants, those are non-native species, and they have big consequences for the environment. Sometimes it's also accidental. Um, everybody hates the stink bugs, and they're really, really gross. Stink bugs were accidentally brought over from Asia in a shipment, and what happened is when they came here, they had no natural predator at all, and because they had no natural predator, they were able to kind of just take over, and their population has exploded. And again, when they're brought in, they take over. It's not really a good thing. So zebra mussels are another example. What happens when invasive species are brought in? Or what can happen when ecosystems change? Or what can happen as a result of human interaction? Is that organisms can no longer effectively survive in their current environment. And when their population numbers start to go down, and we notice it, we say that they're threatened. That species, that group of interbreeding organisms, is on a decline. And what happens is if the numbers continue to go, we switch from threatened to endangered. And the idea is there that we really, really need to step up if we want this species to continue to survive. And then we go all the way to extinction where it's completely gone off the planet. Now, again, we talked about extinction in the evolution podcast, and extinction is not always a bad thing because it paves the way for other organisms. If the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct, scientists hypothesize that mammals would not have been able to kind of take over in the way that we have. What the concern is right now is we are seeing a much faster rate of extinction than we previously have for organisms on this planet, and we're not sure if it's due to some sort of natural cycle or human interaction or other things, but it's something to be mindful of. Toto bird is just an example of the species that used to exist and now it's gone extinct. Another idea of what happens in ecology is changing over time. That's something that happens with evolution as well. Um, but succession is the idea that an ecosystem has some sort of sudden change. And if you've ever seen a plot of land that used to have a house on it start to go and you know the house has been abandoned, over time you see that nature kind of comes right on back and this could be that idea you mow the lawn you mow the lawn you mow the lawn for 20 years and then you abandon the house given enough time you know this normal succession pattern will take over or if there is a volcano and the whole area is completely destroyed or if there was previously ice here and because we're seeing glaciers and other things receding this area is suddenly exposed what happens first is your plants take over, small annual plants. And what they're able to do is they're able to start to grow and then they die very quickly and then they allow more organic matter to be present. So it's a bigger food source. And then your perennials start to take over. And then what happens is seeds from animals or seeds from wind are brought over and then shrubs take over and they start to kind of kill out some of these plants due to competing for sunlight. And then what you see is larger trees start coming in and ultimately you get to our hardwood trees. So it's just showing the idea of an ecosystem. Maybe species will go extinct in that ecosystem and maybe these species will be gone forever. But usually nature has a way of bouncing back and result to adversity. So to sum up this podcast, we're looking at ecology and there's a lot of mini topics we covered in ecology. But ultimately we're looking at how do organisms interact with each other and interact with their surrounding environment. When we go from the bottom up, we can organize these different groupings to help us better study them in ecology. If I want to focus solely on communities, for example, I'm looking at all the different species in a certain area, but not necessarily focusing on the abiotic factors. 
biotic living factors and abiotic non-living factors influence ecosystems. Organisms obviously do interact with each other, whether it's competition or predation, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism. There's different ways to interact, and species can adapt to those changes in the environment where they become extinct.